All right. Well, we're continuing with the the proposed 2006, 2026 NHC changes, and this is first draft. Get the stuff put together to submit the comments for the second portion of the draft. And when that second portion comes out, we'll probably start going over some of that because uh, more than likely that's going to happen, you know, unless something happens on the floor or it happens at the standards council. So I don't know if you saw, but I got my first ever public comment submitted. So I'm pretty excited yeah, about that. I knew that. All right. Now let's take a look here and see what has taken place. Now this one here, they, they have done some changes here. Okay. And they've added some stuff. So there was some revision and a, a couple of things added here, but what they did is talk about the, the short circuit current rating. And they, they actually put this in a list format, but what I want to point out, this, this is going to uh, uh, tie in with some of the other changes that it made. So, you know, that we've done previously, like they did with 110.16, 110.24. Uh, uh, and one ten point twenty one, okay. Hey James, so the 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 upper part is blocking it. Is this four oh eight? Yeah, four eight point six. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. It, the upper part, the little light part, is blocking it. You can't see it. Yeah, this is dealing with switchboard, switch switch gear, and panel boards. And what they're they're doing here is, uh, I'll just look at print one. And it says available fault current at the line terminals, and and they're making sure this is going to tie back in with Article 110. And the date the calculation was performed shall be field marked in a readily accessible location on the enclosure at the point of supply. Okay. Then sure. it says the short circuit current rating of switchboards and panel boards at nominal circuit voltage based on the overcurrent devices installed shall be field marked in a readily accessible location on the enclosure. Okay? Gotcha. So you can have the available fault current or the short circuit current rating, whichever one. And and then it tells you that that marking will require, would be required to comply here with 110.21B. So in other words, you're putting a warning there. Basically what that means is that it'll have uh, uh, orange on it, okay? because that's a warning right. if it if it was just identification of something it'd be yellow and if it was something that's danger it would be done in red okay and so yeah and that's a good point because i've seen the ones that are in red and that when it, that's the ones that say there is no ppe to work on this energized that's right it, it depends on exactly which type and that's why they don't say a color here they just tell you to comply with 110.21b based on that Right. And and this is this in here is a really good one. The available fault current calculation shall be documented and made available to those uh, that are authorized to inspect, install, or maintain the installation. Now let me let me explain something here about this. Uh, you're when when we put this together, when we do our change book, I can already tell you, I, I I've never seen anybody else in their their code change books do this okay they may have this in there and tell you all right we need to do this okay this is a change but what mm -hmm. you're going to have to do at this point you're going to need to go over and look at 130.5 in the 70e the reason that this documentation is so important is because when you get over there and you look at the 70e this has to be checked every five years True. okay so that means it's going to have to be redocumented Okay, so when when we're telling you these things, one thing that that we're sort of known for is we correlate the changes with other standards, and you don't you won't see anybody else doing it. They may start, but I can tell you up to this point, they haven't done it. Okay, well we right. go that extra step because there's other information that you have to be aware of. Now when you look at Print five, 
it says when modification to the electrical installation occurs that affects available fault current at the line terminal's equipment, the following shall be uh, applied. Well, you're going to have to take and you're going to have to verify or recalculate to ensure at this point that the equipment ratings are sufficient for the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment. And then you got to make sure that the field markings that you done in print one there are adjusted to re reflect those new levels of available fault current. Okay. Now, True. look at this. Then they have a little thing here they want you to look at. They say when overcurrent devices are added or replaced, the interrupting rating of the replacement devices shall be equal to or greater than the available fault current. So if you recalculate it, that overcurrent device may uh, have to be replaced in order to reflect the new available fault current. True. Okay. I've, so, I've actually seen times before where they've actually had to make the wire, the conductors longer by like 10 feet to get a lower available fault current. Sure, there's there's things you can do and that's, that. this here to me is a good change, okay? And, mm -hmm. and the only thing I don't like here is there should be another informational note here to refer to you to 70 key, okay? Sure. But yeah. if, you, if you actually know uh, uh, what you're doing and you go back and look in Article 110 and you pick up 110.24 A and B, it gets into modification too and they actually refer you to 70E over there as your general requirements. I'm sort of surprised they didn't put it here. But uh, I look forward to your public comment. <laughs> yeah, so they always <laughs> say, isn't it? Right, I'm not going to go through the committee statement there. All right. Now, this is 409.23. This is where you're getting into your industrial uh, equipment here. And they, they did a few changes here. And they're making it clear that there is going to be a need here for you to have marking or documentation for the location of the disconnects. Okay? Because the way it is right now, uh, uh, you can go look in other... Uh, uh, articles, but there isn't enough language there right now to be sufficient in order to take care of the multiple sources of supply that are here. Okay? True. Because you're dealing with industrial control panels. Okay? Yeah. So what they did, they incorporated it, everything right here and tell you about the identification. Then they also talk to you about the multiple sources of supply and they tell you they have to be permanently marked that state warning multiple disconnecting means required to de-energize all sources of supply 50 volts or more okay so and then of course i'll tell you that that the markings that you have here they cannot be handwritten and they have to be affixed to the exterior in order to withstand the environment okay true so and just to let everyone know um, I did do extensive research on this. Uh, the label maker, the labels that come off a label maker, they are rated for the to handle exterior environment. I did do research on that. And label maker is compliant. As long as it says on that label maker tape that's suitable for uh, the environment. Okay, cool. All right. Now, this one here, 410... Uh, 184 what they that what they did they they reorganized this okay but um, when they also did it they added some additional details here okay so you'll see they took out the exception in the informational note and they they basically moved the informational note down a little bit and what they did is they wanted to make sure that when you're looking at this, these uh, special purpose ground fault circuit interrupters, that you want to know what the information is on that and the considerations that are necessary when you're using these type of GFCIs. Now, okay. if you look here, they, they come in with A here, okay? And this is where you're getting in 
to lighting equipment that you're going to be using that is identified for horticultural use. Okay. Now, okay. what they're going to tell you here is if you have a branch circuit that's rated 50, 150 volts or less to ground, single or three phase, you've got to have uh, class A GFCI protection. But once you're above 150 volts to ground, they're going to tell you that you have to use listed special GFCI protection here, and the ground fault current trip it will not exceed 20 amp, 20 milliamps. Okay, right. so they're they're just saying that uh, you can come in and use this where you have this these these uh, lighting equipment for horticultural use and they're employing flexible cords where one or more separable connections are attachment plugs. Okay. I'm actually a little disappointed on this. I don't know if you knew, but I had a public input to make this article 420. They, yeah, and, they rejected and, it. And, it should have been I'll, in 420. I'll, I'll tell you this. This is interesting because if you read this, it says for one or more separable connectors or attachment plugs shall be supplied by outing out. Okay, well, where's yeah. the lighting outlet? It's there where the box is. It's not a point yeah. that's just free floating in infinite space. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying when you read the way some of this is written, it, it's literally saying a lighting outlet. That means it, it, it means it has to be something substantial. Okay? Yeah. It's just not a point, you know, like they're True. trying to tell us. And yeah. language like this proves exactly what we're saying. Okay. 100%. I agree. Now, the next one here is 422.5. This is where you're getting into your appliances. And they did a little bit of work here. Okay. Now, when you look at this, they, they've come in and they did some clarification. But before I get into this, I want to read the substantiation from the code making panel. Okay. I want you to. Uh, see uh oh man i accidentally clicked that out god dang it well what they basically said here i'll bring this in next week and show it again but what they did they came in and they said that their panel takes care of the appliances and uh code making panel two handles the branch circuit they're basically telling you don't tell us what to do <laughs> when sure. you go and you look at this Okay, and yeah. this all falls back to what? An outlet. Okay. Well, and there's another weird thing that not, nothing in that list says AC units. Oh, no. And, and <laughs> guess what? AC unit is, oh, wait for it. It's an appliance. Yeah, 100%. You know, I'll tell you, this is interesting. And, and I'll just give everybody some, some background. We did a case, Dad and I did one time, and this this guy uh got hurt well their special expert come in and he said that um uh that ac unit uh was i'm trying to remember how he placed it but what it come down to i don't remember exactly what happened but he was saying it was a motor and we come in and we said, no, it isn't a motor, it's an appliance. We, we were hired by this, this uh, attorney firm out in uh, Houston. And uh, we went in and they got him up on uh, the stand. He was sitting there talking about this and, and this was the reason, that I can't remember exactly. Oh, I remember what it was about. Uh, he said it had to have uh, 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 a disconnect. And at that time, it's been a long time ago, basically, if you remember, they didn't put a disconnect out there. They actually used a circuit breaker to do that. True. And uh, he said the reason is because it was a motor. Well, we went in and you had the definition, went over appliance. And when, he, when our attorney got up, he said, can you read that definition? And it said, an air conditioner is an example of an appliance. <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> and he just sat there, he goes, so you still saying that's a motor? And he goes, well, he goes, reading that, he goes, I'd have to agree, it's an appliance. 
the case. Yo, was, what up, Worm Brothers? Thanks hey, for brother. joining. Awesome for stopping by, man. Just stopping in to smash that like button, dude. Awesome, man. That's what we okay. like, man. Always, you're always welcome here, Worm Brothers. So let let's let's look at this. So when you look at A, it talks about the appliances, and it, it talks about. It shall be GFCI protected, and and it says is supplied by branch circuits that meet the following conditions. Now, this is interesting to me, and I'll tell you why, because they're basically don't care what it says up in chapter two and what article yeah. two ten. They're basically putting their own thing in here, and they yeah. they say that it. Ex uh, exceed the, the low voltage contact limit as defined in Article 100, does not exceed 150 volts to, to ground, does not exceed 60 ampere single phase or 100 amp amperes three phase. Okay, now that's interesting because if I go look at B, they call it appliances now. They just say mm -hmm. appliances, you don't have all this other stuff and the multiple and all of this. And they say the following appliances shall be a GFCI protected, but if I look in A, it says appliances, appliances indicated in 422.5B, well, here's 5B, and then look, they have all these appliances listed here. Now, I'll tell you why I find that interesting. And nowhere does it say connected to outlet either. That's right. Now, <laughs> th this, is, this is one thing that, that uh, I find interesting right here. Okay. Why do they not have all these new devices that were put in 210.8D? True. I don't see microwave in there. Yeah. Where is it? I, I don't see all these in here, but yet they would still uh, hopefully meet these requirements in A. And then they yeah. put a new note one and look what they said. C210.8 for GFCI for protection requirements for branch circuit outlet where covered locations warrant such protection. True. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so basically, it sounds like we have a, a little grudge war here. Well, there's another problem too because there's a proposal to increase uh, to 60 amperes on 210.8F. Yeah. This, this, I don't know how that's going to work. I, I will ask this. Are some of these items that are listed here in 422.5B, are they listed over in 210.8D? Yeah. Uh, not, not all of them, though. No, but th there's items <laughs> listed there, aren't there? Yeah. Sure. Well, why aren't the items from 210.8D here? All of them. Yeah. Why are they all not there? They're, they're, you know, you know. I heard Jeremy Weed. Oh well, you know the co-panels work together and everything. Yeah, they work together, but not always. And I'm showing you here. There's a disconnect right here. I don't and, see cooktop in there. I don't see range in there. That's right. That's what I'm trying to say. Look at what's not listed here, but you go back and look at 210.8D, see if these items are in there, or a lot of them. So, I would say I would say the one that is not in there that I think should be in there is electric clothes dryer. Like, there was a very sad story about a mom and a daughter that lost their life in electric clothes dryer. And to me personally, I think that should be Class A protected. I think there's a lot of human interaction with that appliance and that's what I think. Just that one case, it was really sad. Uh, I think it was the mom got uh, was getting electrocuted and got um, ener uh, was energized by the frame of the dryer and the daughter tried to get her off and they both died together. And that was a really sad story and that's my reason why I think dryers should be Class A protected. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I, you know, I'm going to put in a public comment on a lot of this stuff and I'm going to try to interject a lot of my opinion on and you guys can be mad at me all you want. Um, if you think that I'm being insensitive that 
I think, hey, this kid jumping on an AC unit, um, you know, like it just it. There's no reason for a code change on that one. But then this mom and daughter that got energized on a, a electric dryer, whether it be hardwired or cord and plug connected, I think that should be class A protected. That's my opinion, and like I say, I'll put it in public comment stage, and um, like I say, you can hate me or get mad at me or whatever you want to do. I don't care. That's what I believe. I think, it, yeah. it, you know, for the clothes dryer, if they do that, I think there needs to be uh, a reference that uh, over in 250.142 A and B for reference to it uh, for the GSCI protection, because if it comes to be part of the ground and whether it's a three wire or four wire so 100 uh, percent. no that's a really good point there too because that gets lost a lot that a lot of these appliances that become energized don't have a grounded conductor yeah and 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 i'll point another thing out in that informational note that that really caught my attention is they say where covered locations and this is one gets me warrant warrant such protection it de it didn't say is required it says where it warrants it in other words we don't agree with it <laughs> it's the way i take sure. it <laughs> yeah. so i just want everybody to see this this is what's going on right now and this is falls back to some of the stuff that we've been talking about in the outlet and why you know uh, uh, stuff not being compatible and uh, tripping because it, there's compatibility issues and I've made this statement when it all first started I said you know if they really want it they need to use special GFCI protection there you can't use class A because it's not compatible and you know they say oh, you don't know what the hell you're talking about well apparently I do because it's all coming in now so uh, well, for those that said that <laughs> you know and one thing that you're going to want to look at too is that there's a lot of new items that were added uh, by code making panel 2 and code making panel 17 decided not to add those okay. and you know to me personally um, does that mean that they are compatible and could work I don't know and so the reason that we're pointing out kind of this whole feud is like when it comes to correlation, uh, there's a lot of arrogance uh, from one side that uh, is is actually kind of frustrating because I just don't understand how they're just like, you need to do this or else you're wanting to kill children, you know? Like to me, that just, it rubbed me the wrong way because I'm like, wait a minute, you know, that's not the way the code works. They're like, we mandate this. No, you don't. You write code language, and if it doesn't mean what you say it means, then it doesn't apply, you know? So, well, you know, it's like I told them on, on the discussion stuff. I said, you know, y'all that are coming out here attacking all of us and everything continuously, I said, you're part of the mob, you know? It's do as we say or else we'll attack you and try to ruin your reputation and everything. And mm -hmm. you know what? Go ahead. Uh, I, I'd rather have my reputation run than just let them just try to walk all over me, you know, because uh, everybody should have a voice to be able to speak and and have their opinion on something. And I find it very interesting. They don't like our opinion, what you and I say. They, they've literally came down on us pretty hard because of our opinion. All right? Yeah. And, and and I, I agree, uh, and like I say, uh, we'll move on to the next code change. I, I, I really appreciate the way you're bringing this up because that's gonna be a point of contention in 2026 because they, we have to have correlation to have this move forward for electrical safety. Oh, sure, we do. And uh, I think that's, I think it's good going through all this at the start so people can sort of see what's coming down the pike here, you know, and yeah. it takes me, you know, it takes me time to go through and look all this stuff up. So I hope everybody appreciates it. It's, you know, I, one of the things I sort of like it, that we're always pushing the envelope, you know, and bringing new uh, content and stuff to the 
YouTube side and to our groups and everything. And I think that's one reason our groups and everything have built, built so well is because, you know, we, we do care about the industry and we care sure. about providing good content to everybody, you know, make everybody think, you know, it, nobody knows everything and hell, we may even be wrong on something, you know, but it, the thing is, we're showing you things that ha how we perceive it at this point until we get clarification. It doesn't mean we're wrong or we're right. It just means right now, this this is the way we perceive it. And until there's a change made, <laughs> you know, so far we hadn't been proved wrong on any of it. But uh, hopefully, True. you know, we get it all clarified. Yeah, and just a big uh, shout out to you, James. Uh, James has taken a lot of uh, heat, um, you know, basically saying that uh, his uh, publications have been getting sued and stuff and like wrongful allegations and stuff. And, and that's fine if people want to do that and uh, make themselves look uh, like fools, then they can continue to make those allegations. But um, the one thing I think is awesome uh, is... I'm learning every day. I'm learning something new every day. I'm out in the field. I'm, I'm out there. I'm installing uh, receptacles. I'm, you know, making up boxes. I'm, you know, terminating lights. I'm making up lighting control. Like the very first lighting control on my job site that was made up was me. I went and made it up so I knew how to do it, you know. But at the same time, it's like I'm not going to sit there and tell you how to do something. And then what was funny was I went and I made it up because one of the conductors said it was optional so I didn't hook it up and then it didn't work yeah. and then we went and we turned power on and it didn't work and then they're like oh dude Bill what's up you know and they're giving me a bunch of crap you know and then I realized I was like why would they say in the paperwork that's optional it's not optional yeah. like your lights aren't going to work without it so that's how that's part of learning and it's part of the humbling process of like I'm not always right James is not always right and we're learning and we're, you know, growing together. And I think that's what it means a lot for all the people out there that's in the community, that's electricians, that's following us, that's joining us. You know, there are people that work with us. There are people that grow with us. There are people that, you know, learn the code with us. And a lot of these people are just acting like they know better. And if you don't do this, you're wrong and whatever. I, to me, that's fine, you know? Sure. Um, like I say, Daniel knows 100% uh i love just posting a, a conduit run and saying what do you guys think you know because you'll get more learning out of that just that one conduit run than you ever will about electrical theory or anything you know they'll tell you you know how you're supposed to do a box offset how you're supposed to space it how you're supposed to you know make it look you know how you're supposed to plan it out stuff like that so um, that's part of the whole reason I like the electrical wall of shame, the electrical code discussion, all that different stuff that we do, you know, means a lot. Yeah. Well, this one, 43098A, this is going to deal with your motor control centers. And what this is going to get into is the identification of the power sources. Now, uh, they still have that it's marked in accordance with 110.21 and all of that. But in case, uh, in the event of emergency, if you have a motor control center that is supplied by feeders, then it tells you that these motor control centers have to be permanently marked. And it says in accordance with these following three items, it says with the identification and location of the means necessary to disconnect all power to the motor control center. And with a label that is permanently fixed and sufficient durability to withstand the environment involved and that it's not handwritten. So basically, there's got to be something there telling the location of where the disconnect is in order to disconnect that motor control center in case of an emergency. I agree with so, that. So don't let anybody tell you that you have to have phenolic labels on that. A label maker is code compliant. Sure. Now, this one, uh, this gets in the short circuit current rating and uh, what they did, they they changed the language here a little bit. And the reason they did that, this is this is to provide better consistency, okay, with other parts of the code. So you're gonna see here that it's gonna talk about 
the motor control center and it's going to tell you it shall not be installed where the available fault current exceeds its short current rating as marked in accordance with 430.98a well if and and this is the reason i put this in here because if i come back here this is what we just looked at okay so it's one thing that i have a marking and identification here that i have to identify where the the means is located to disconnect the power they also are coming here and they talk about the available fault current and tying it back in with that section that all of this is done uh uh uh, with available fault current here. So when you have to get inside that motor control center, you, you can, you know, y'all have heard me say this before. How do, how do you go in and you determine what that PPE is when you're going to work on this equipment? This is one where they're telling you with other parts of the code for consistency. So if I'm going to work on something energized, well, what is one of the first things that happens? If I go over and look at 110.16, 110.21, 110.24, all of those have something in, in, in uh, consistency. They all refer me to where? Yeah. 70 E. 70 E. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, th this is going to be, this is, this is exactly why you want this next cycle. You want to make sure you get the stalk up uh, code change publication because what will yeah. happen here is we'll have a loop in there that's going to tie the NEC in what you need to look at as far as design and installation is concerned and then we'll have the safety part in there with 70E and then if you have to maintain this equipment we'll also have the 70B section okay true so, and and see that's a good point because the one thing that I want to say that I really like about the stall cut publications is it eliminates guesswork. It eliminates um, people trying to think they know stuff they don't know. You guys come out, you say, this is what it is, this is what it is, this is what it is. If you go by this, you'll never be wrong. And I That's freaking right. love that about the stall cut publication. You know that there's no mistakes done with that interpretation. Sure. And, and, you know, one of the things, you know, uh, I used to be on the 70B committee. Quite, uh, it's mm -hmm. been probably about 10 years now. Uh, I had to give it up because I had too much other stuff going. But we did maintain on 70E. Yeah, you just wanted to freaking play pool on Tuesdays. Just tell everyone <laughs> the truth. And Fridays and play golf on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have some free time every now and then. I'm playing golf, yeah. as a matter of fact. But um, right. the... You know, uh, we've been on the 70E committee for over 30 years. Um, uh, we may even get off of that committee because we got too much going on with all this new stuff. And then, you know, we're also members of the EECA committee, which is Electrical Equipment and Chemical Atmospheres, which we've been on for over 30 years. So, you know, we've been part of the standard making process for a long, long time. And that's why we know how all these standards correlate with each other. We even keep up, if we were doing hazardous locations, we even keep you up and tie in if we're doing hazardous with the API, which is the American Petroleum Institute, and we deal with API 500. And if we get into a zone location, we deal with 505. We even put those in there for you to correlate back with. So, right. you know, we, we really do try to tie everything together all right nice now this this one here is where you're going to get in and you're dealing with your hva systems and this is another one and two family installations and what they did here they're telling you here they say in addition to the requirements of 110.22a okay it says the disconnecting means located at the exterior unit of a split phase system HVAC shall identify the location here of all indoor units supplied by the disconnect. Okay, so the, the reason they want this identification is if you're an installer, you're an inspector, uh, even if you're maintaining the system, this is to help you quickly locate the disconnect equipment for that split system 
H HVAC unit. Okay. So would that would that only apply to like a single machine? Because you know how they have like that single machine where they say that you only need one disconnect for a single machine, or is this where you actually have a disconnect for both sides for the outdoor unit and the indoor unit? Well, you got them for the indoor units and outdoor. You need to know where the indoor units are that are being supplied from this split phase system. Because there is an actual single machine requirement where they say that this split system is a single machine and all you need to do is provide one disconnect. Well, that's for the outside one for that unit, for that split phase system. This is for yeah, the location of the indoor units where they're disconnected. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, I guess, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to research that one a little more because the single machine says you only need one disconnect for both uh, units. On the well, it would, it would that, work for both units, but if you're doing something inside for one unit, then you would use, you would have a disconnect for that to identify that location that's being supplied gotcha. by that split phase system. Okay, I got you. Uh, all right, okay. Oh, yeah. And that uh, wraps us up tonight for the um, 